um, joining our first civic series of 2021. And um, the League of Women Voters of Wheaton, representing the communities of Carroll Stream, Warrenville, West Chicago, Winfield, and of course Wheaton, in collaboration and with support from Cantini and the McCormick Foundation, have been bringing civic awareness series to our members and communities since 2017. And in, in this time of COVID, we continue to provide the series on, on Zoom, but we certainly look forward to the day when we can all return to the historic McCormick House and gather again in, in person. And I'm Catherine Franzik. I'm the secretary of our league and also the environment chair. And I'm pleased tonight to welcome Mark Ailes, a member of the Citizens Climate Lobby. And he's gonna to speak to us tonight about climate action. And Mark is a retired science teacher from Addison Trail High School. He grew up in Michigan, but has lived his adult life in Illinois. And he's been a finalist for the Illinois Teacher of the Year, 1996, 97. And he's a longtime science Olympiad coach and he's a cyclist, bicyclist. And he's been an active member of the Citizens Climate Education for three years and is the Citizens Climate Lobby Liaison for the Illinois District 6 here in the page. Citizens Climate Action provides a consistently respectful nonpartisan approach to climate education designed to create a broad sustainable foundation for climate action across all geographic regions and political inclinations. By building upon shared values rather than partisan divides and empowering their supporters to work in keeping with concerns of their local communities, they work towards the adoption of fair, effective, and sustainable climate change solutions. So without any further ado, I'd like to introduce Mark Hales. Thank you, Catherine. That was a really nice introduction. Um, I'd like to, to share my screen to get started. Oh, yeah. Okay, go ahead. Okay. Thank you, Ben. Oops. Okay. We've got, do we have the slides or Mark? Are you, okay, there, there we go. There we go. Okay, can you see that? Yes. Yep. Okay, great. So, as she said, I'm from Citizens Climate Lobby. Um, we also have a, a branch called Citizens Climate Education. Citizens Climate Education is um, um, tax deductible and we educate about climate and then lobby, we lobby for action on climate at the national level. So um, I'm just gonna touch on uh, the values real briefly of Citizens Climate Lobby. They're in blue, the, the, in black are League of Women Voter values. And so there's some, definitely some alignment but not perfect alignment. Uh, we're both nonpartisan. Uh, we both believe in uh, providing personal power to our volunteers and engaging citizens to act. And we're both optimistic about the fact that we think government democracy can work. Um, the first two here for League of Women Voters talks about in, um, having knowledge and being well prepared. And that's certainly something that Citizens Climate Lobby emphasizes. Uh, being well prepared, having a lot of knowledge, believing science, and, uh, ha and consulting experts. One difference here is well, um, the first one, we are focused on what we feel is the single most impactful solution to climate change, fee and dividend. And then we both agree that building relationships is important, and we use uh, appreciation, gratitude, and respect to build consensus, which I think League of Women Voters does as well. And finally, the last one, we don't have a specific value for being worldwide, but um, we do hope that our, our um, legislation will have a worldwide impact. And we do, as one of our values, have diversity, 
and I saw in other literature about Ling and women voters that they are interested in that as well. Okay, so now this is uh, my climate story about how I became a climate activist. My story starts with five crazy kids in 1979 who figured they'd ride their bike across the country. Uh, it was a trip of extremes, extremes of temperature, extremes of weather, extremes of emotion, extremes of effort. Uh, this picture on the left is through Hell's Canyon in Oregon. Temperature is about 110. And then we went through a lot of beautiful national parks. This is Glacier National Park. Um, going through all these beautiful parks and nature in Yellowstone, we of course appreciated the outdoors and the environment, but I never really thought about how to protect it or how important it would be to protect it. Along the way, we met lots of wonderful people that um, helped us out as we went. Um, we were riding along our bikes here in Wisconsin and we saw a roadside stand. We stopped to get some fruit and a storm was brewing and it was late in the day. And this family invited us to stay in their living room for the night. My point is that people care about their neighbors and sometimes even strangers. And people want to do the right thing given the opportunity. And of course, we all care about the future. Everybody wants the best for their children and grandchildren. Sometimes it's hard to remember that in the political divisiveness that we find ourselves in these days. But if you really, if it, when it really gets down to it, people have a lot of similar values about what they want for their future generations. Fast forward to a science teacher and a tennis coach. It's my career. And I want to tell you first about a story coaching tennis. In tennis, you're allowed to talk to the players in between games. So I call one of my players over and I was telling her, you know, watch the ball, get your racket back, all this great coaching. And I paused for a second and she said, excuse me, Mr. Ailes? And I go, yeah, could you get my inhaler? So I'm trying to teach her how to play tennis. She's trying to breathe. The point is, is that I never really thought about how the increasing number of students that I had that, that were absent because of respiratory problems or allergies or asthma was related to air pollution and in, to some extent caused by climate change. I never really made that connection while I was teaching. So what did I do? Well, we, I recycled, I rode my bike to work, um, and then every Earth Day, we would put pictures on the, in the halls and then throw them away the next day. So we, we as a group, as teachers, as a community that I was involved in, knew that there was a problem with pollution, knew there was a problem with climate, but didn't really know what we could do about it and didn't do a whole lot. And when I retired in 2013, I needed to think about what the next chapter in my life was going to be about. And so I knew I liked the outdoors and the environment and cared about the environment and cared about the climate. But what could I do as one individual? What kind of difference could I make? It didn't seem like there was much I could do. And then I saw a presentation in 2017 at my church about fee and dividend. Terry, who's on the call today, was the one was one of the two who put on that presentation. And when I saw that presentation, I was like, what? There could be a solution that's that's gonna be fair for low and middle income people, a solution that is not gonna hurt the economy. I was very intrigued. I'd like to show you a one minute video on Citizens Climate Lobby.
So everybody cares about the environment and wants a solution. And so now I was motivated. I wanted to do something, but what could one person do? What, what tools would I need to be effective? Well, I needed to be trained. So um, at the Citizens Climate Lobby meetings, and I went in particular to um, the Great Lakes Regional Meeting that, I, that first got me started, because uh, that's where I learned the five levers of political will. Grass tops and grassroots outreach. So grassroots outreach, you see on the left is tabling, which we can't do right now, but presentations like this are grassroots outreach. And grass tops outreach is where you try to get community influencers to take action on climate. I think this little girl right here on the right is gonna be an influencer in the future. And I built this little um, uh, photo of greenhouse effect box simulator and she's sticking her hand in there. Chapter development, this is a chapter meeting on the left. Um, media outreach, this is an article I had published in the uh, Daily Herald that got picked up by CCL National and finally, lobby meetings. This is a lobby meeting I organized um, and that's representative cast and my representative in the top row there. So what can I do next? Well, 40 years after the bike trip across the country, maybe I didn't get much wiser because I organized another trip with an icon, three of my friends to go from Chicago to Washington DC to try and create a stir and interest in doing action on climate. We were going there to the National CCL Lobby Day and, and conference. Along the way, we saw lots of evidence of climate change, flooded fields, roads damaged by floods. This particular road uh, was closed to cars because of bridge, dam bridge damage, but we could get through on our bikes. As you, tra as you travel by bike uh, across the country, you go through a lot of beautiful farmland and you realize how much of the United States is wonderful farmland. And you would think that politicians would want to protect that farmland for the future. But you have to remember that politicians don't make waves. Politicians ride waves. It's our job to make the waves for them to ride. Along the way, again, we saw many friendly people. People were either positive or curious about our trip. Um, we were riding along and we stopped to take a break and get some water and this gentleman in orange pulled his car up and said, hey, my house is a couple blocks over. You should stop and get something to drink. And so we stopped. He gave us some snacks and drinks and I, I suspected he was a little bit conservative, but he was still, still curious about why we were riding our bikes all the way to DC. And he was particularly intrigued when we told him our solution was market-based and revenue neutral. And so he had a good relationship with his representative and he said he would talk to him about it. Well, we made it. So we raised a little over $5,000 for citizens climate education and we uh, got a nice article in the Daily Herald. But now that we're in DC, the next job is to get trained and to lobby. Hundreds of people from all over the country come to DC for our national lobby days before COVID. And we, uh, we get spend two days doing mock lobby meetings, getting information about our representatives and talking about strategy of how we're going to, uh, to uh, um, meet with them and talk to them about doing something about climate. We met with over 400 of the offices, well over 400 of the offices. Uh, and they meet with us because we're respectful, because we appreciate what their, their efforts and their constraints, 
and we work to give them the information and the motivation that they need to ride the wave to climate action. So what's next? Well, we're definitely headed somewhere. The question is, where do we want to end up? And do we have the will to make it a wonderful place to end up? Sometimes I get the feeling that it's like the old joke about the guy who found out that accidents happen within 25 miles of home. So he moved. Well, clearly, ignoring the problem, or trying to get away from the problem is not the solution. We're headed for some sort of bright outcome. We don't want that to be a fiery end. We want it to be something that our kids and our grandkids will look back and say, boy, they really did the right thing and helped us to a, to a future that's not just bright and fiery, but bright and beautiful. So that's what I'm hoping we can achieve. Okay, so what can, what can we do? What can you do? Well, clearly, you don't have to ride your bike to Washington, D.C. to make an impact. Um, you can be involved in a lot of ways in order to do something. And of course, it depends on how much time you have. If you don't have much time, like I imagine a number of you don't, one of the things you could do that only takes five, 10 minutes is um, our monthly calling campaign. And this is where you get an email once a month and it gives you some information about what you can say and you just call your congressman and you um, tell them something that you want them to take action on climate, thank him, and then you uh, record it. Say, I did, I made my call. And just to show you how easy it is, let's try it right now. Okay, so here I got my phone. I'm going to turn it off airplane mode. <laughs> and surprisingly, today I actually got an email that said, uh, it's time to call about climate change. <laughs> How about that for timely? A monthly calling campaign, it says. I'm going to push it. I'm going to, it says, CCL's monthly calling campaign. A view call in guide. My representative is Sean Caston. Um, it gives me a phone number. It gives me a call in script that I can use if I want. Now, I'm going to call him. I would normally call during business hours. So let's try and see what happens. Record your message after the tone. When you've finished, you can hang up or press one for more options. Hi, this is Mark Ailes. I'm a constituent. I live at 223 West Crystal Avenue in Lombard, Illinois. I just want to thank Representative Caston for his strong efforts on climate and for a climate price. And I'd like to encourage him to reach across the aisle and work together with his, his Republican counterparts to, to take action on climate. We believe that any durable solution has to be bipartisan. Thank you. Now there's a little spot here that says, I called and I click it, I called and I did it. So that's how long it took. Um, okay, so I'm here to answer any questions you have. Um, I'd be happy to talk to you further and that's what I'd like to spend most of our time doing. So Mark, Roberta's asking, you know, she's, when she's made calls to her congressperson or senator, she's only gotten through to a staff person. Does that matter? Good question. Uh, a staff member sometimes is better. <laughs> um, but because yeah, a staff member has more time to listen and to um, hear what you're saying and to record it and then um, and then get that information to the congressman. So yes, yeah, staff members are typical. I don't think I've ever um, had a congressman answer the phone. So that's pretty rare. So a message or 
Oh, staff member is great. Great. So are there Illinois issues that sh we should be aware of? And maybe we should back up a second and think about, um, you know, maybe you can tell us a little bit more about this, if there's a bill that you're supporting, you know, the background on, on, on. Oh, sure. Sure. Let's, let's talk a little bit about the, the bill we're supporting. Um, let me share my screen again. Okay, so the bill we're supporting is um, was introduced in the last Congress and it was called the Energy Innovation and Carbon Dividend Act. It has to be reintroduced in the new Congress, but the way it works <clears throat> is, is pretty, um, pretty straightforward. All the fossil fuels that come out of the ground or come into the country in a port are given a fee. The first year, the fee is $15. And then every year after that, the fee gradually increases. What this does, this increases the cost of fossil fuels. And so everything that uses fossil fuels, either directly or indirectly, are gonna, or the price is gonna rise, which is gonna cause people not to use those as much, especially if they see in the future that those prices are gonna get higher and higher. But of course, nobody wants to pay more for something. So what we do is we take the fossil fuel fees and we collect them all. And then all the net revenue is given back to households throughout the United States. Every person, every citizen gets an equal share. So as it turns out, that share that you get for the for the uh, low, low income and middle income people, the 60, over 60% 60 of the people in the United States actually receive more money back from the dividend than their increased cost will be from the rising fossil fuel costs. So people that need the most benefit get it. The low and middle income people that are impacted the most by fossil fuels are the ones that, that have the, the best benefit. They have the get the most. And that's because their carbon footprint in general is smaller. And those that have a huge carbon footprint, well, that fee is, that dividend is not going to be enough to cover their additional costs, but they can afford it. And typically, it's less than 2.2% uh, of their income, less than 0.2% of their income. So um, this, this system of making fossil fuel fees rise but giving people the resources to handle that will force, will, will encourage people through the free market to go green. If, if I insulate my house with some of this money, I'll get to save even more of the money in the future because I'll pay less fossil fuel, fuel costs. And all sorts of ways that I can save money by going green. Likewise, businesses, if, since they're all in the same boat, will be thinking, geez, how can I lower my, my carbon footprint so I can save more money and be more competitive? And innovators were going to be like, oh, gee, I can, uh, if, if I figure out a way to reduce fossil fuel consumption, I can make money. So it's, it's a way to, to get the economy to continue in a stable fashion but transition quickly off fossil fuels. We estimate in, in, uh, by 2030, we'll reduce fossil fuel consumption by 40% or more, um, or in 12 years by 40% by or more. Now, one of the problems is that, of course, we export and import as well. And so some countries might not have a carbon fee. So if they were to import something, they would have a competitive advantage. So we have what's called a carbon border adjustment. What that is, is that any country that we trade with, if they don't have a carbon fee, 
they're going to have to pay a, a, a um, tariff when they put st uh, energy intensive goods into the United States so that our companies are not at a disadvantage. And likewise, if we have a company that's trading to a to a trading American goods to a country that doesn't have a fee, we would rebate rebate that fee to them so that they would not be at a disadvantage. And since the United States is either first or second in the world in terms of economies, and we trade with virtually all the countries, this one little bill is going to incentivize the entire world to have a carbon fee. And of course, we're not at the forefront of this, <laughs> as it turns out, because um, the European Union is always talk, already talking about putting a border adjustment in 2023, and Canada is talking about putting in a border adjustment because they're ahead of us at this point. I'll stop there for now. So, Mark, here's Sarah is asking a question about um, what are some of the arguments or pushback against. Um, this act and what's the response of CCL and other advocates. And I guess to step back a second, I have a question about who's the, who, are, who are the sponsors on the Energy Innovation Carbon Dividend Act? That's a good question too. Um, so first, first in terms of the sponsors, uh, since Citizens Climate Lobby is nonpartisan, when we introduced this bill, um, the first time, when we introduced this bill the first time, we made sure that there were the Democrats and Republicans on the bill. And there were, and so we could say that it would say, and it was bipartisan. When we introduced it the second time, we, re, we refused to introduce it unless we had one Democrat and one Republican to introduce it. And so we did, we had one Democrat and one Republican. But at that point, the, po the policies became so polarized and it became so dangerous for Republicans to talk about climate that no Republican would, no other Republican would go on. And so at that point, we like, well, we still want to get support for our bill. So we, um, we encouraged people to sign on and we ended up with over 80 co-sponsors, but they were all Democrats except for the one original Republican co-sponsor. Now, it, so it may sound like this is, you know, just supported by Democrats, but in terms of liberals and conservatives, we have a conservative caucus in Citizens Climate Lobby. We have conservative support. It's just in the last administration, the Republicans could, could not publicly come out in favor it for fear that they would get primaried from the right. Um, so, why would conservatives like this bill? Well, they like it because it's market-based and because it's revenue neutral, it doesn't increase the size of government. Why would liberals like this bill? They like it because it's progressive, because the, the people on the low income benefit the most from the bill. And they like it, they both like it because it's, you know, we've had studies and economists, over 3,000 economists support this bill and say that it's going to do something um, that is not going to hurt the economy and, and it's going to be effective. Now, let me say one more thing about Republicans before I go, and that is the Republicans are recognizing that they need to do something. Um, there's a survey that came out that um, Republicans under the age of 40, over 70%, 70% wanted the government to do something about climate. So they're recognizing that they have to get on board. Now, as far as the arguments against our bill, well, because we have, you know, we have some conservative support and we have some liberal support, you know, and people are suspicious, right? So, so you're going to have people on the, on the far left and on the far right that are not going to like our bill for various reasons because the far left say it's not progressive enough. And the far right's going to say that it's, it's too much government or something along those lines. Um, and, the, and the far left doesn't like that we 
on limit regulation for the first 10 years. We, we felt like that we needed to have, um, we, should, we shouldn't penalize companies twice. In other words, if they're paying a fee on the carbon, we're not going to I'll put another regulation on top of that. So the, the limited regula regulation in our bill is only for the fossil fuels that are already regulated by the fee in, in effect. Um, but, certain, but certainly some liberals don't like the, that. But of course, states could still put in any regulations they want. So Mark Dye is saying with equal dividends to all households, it may need some clarification here. It doesn't in address environmental justice. Um, well, that's a good question. Well, and, 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 and to some extent it does, I think. And that is because it's progressive. So those that are, um, have been most impacted by, you know, pollution and that sort of thing, um, th those that are low and minorities and stuff that are stuck in those positions, they're going to end up better off from this bill. But let me say this. Citizens Climate Lobby does not think that this is the only thing. <laughs> the, it, we think that this is like a toolbox to get things started. We certainly don't think this solves all the problems, that this, 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 this does not solve social justice. We think it's we think it's progressive, and so it will help low and low income people more. So that's a good part of it. But we know that there are there are other things that need to happen. We just think that we need some that this. If we have this first, this will get the ball rolling and re make some really effective progress on climate. But we definitely know that there more, more needs to be done in the social justice ring. And also, you know, just because the economy is not going to get hurt, just because this is going to create jobs, doesn't mean it's going to be create jobs for everybody. Okay. Obviously, the fossil fuel industry, people are going to lose their jobs, and we need to do something about that to help help those people. Do you have a position about CJA in Illinois? Um, we don't. We're, we're focused on national legislation. So we don't, as an organization, take positions on it. Of course, I think that you know, if you polled our members, there would be support, strong support for it. So in the last Congress, it was difficult to get it through um, because support dwindled on the Republican side? Yeah, and, and certainly the administration was not interested in doing anything and so um, they actually did, the House did actually pass um, some significant, they didn't pa pass this bill, um, but they did pass some significant climate legislation, at least for, um, for research and development, stuff like that. And it just sat on Mitch McConnell's desk, right? So, um, so that a lot of those, some of those bills, Citizens Climate Lobby, in addition to pushing this bill, will have what are called supporting asks. So they'll have secondary asks. And several of our secondary asks were passed in the last big um, budget bill that passed, the bill that passed. So, yeah, so we have some successes for sure. So how are you seeing it now with the new Biden administration? I imagine there is some optimism going forward. There is, there's optimism. That, uh, that's, that some things are going to be done, certainly administratively. But, but, and we're optimistic that something can be done legislatively. But it's not going to be easy. And it's not going to be done without some push. Because there's going to be uh, you know, resistance to do anything like there always is in Congress. And you know, like I said, you know, congressmen want to pick the low-hanging fruit, right? <laughs> and so we want. We have to push them to do more, for sure. And and we we are concerned, as I mentioned earlier, that if we don't do it bipartisan, then the next uh, uh, administration can just you know turn it around. You mentioned that there were some successes last time around. Can you tell us about those? 
Um, yeah, and, and Terry can probably chime in here and help me a little bit, but um, we, there was a bill on, on uh, battery uh, research and some infrastructure stuff. Terry, could you give more specifics about that? Um, uh, I, okay, I, the BEST Act passed. Oh, the, the BEST Act was um, introduced by Congressman Foster from Naperville. And BEST stands for something, and I think the B is battery, but it's basically right. maybe battery and energy storage technology. So, um, uh, that that bill was for money for research for um, basically improving the grid with um, storage, and that kind of thing will be essential, um, you know, to for de decarbonization. Um, but those those it's it's not that hard to get bipartisan support for uh, kind of ancillary things that would help, but don't, like don't really address the main problem of fossil fuels. Um, so the the bill that that Mark has been talking about is is the main one um, that addresses fossil fuels and that we that we have to we have to get through. And everyone, I'd like to introduce Terry. She's the Greater Naperville um, person, lead person for Citizens Climate Lobby. So I just wanted to introduce you, Terry. Thanks for being on the call. Thanks, the Thanks Catherine. Please. Any other questions? You can put them in the chat. It seems to me that um, with this new administration, though, focus on COVID first, but I know climate is, a, is an important initiative in getting back into the Paris Accord. Yep. Yeah, he signed that the first day. Mm hmm And there's a question about um, why is CCL decided to focus on federal legislation? Um, that's a good question. The, we, we, we understand that in order to, uh, because, client, because carbon pollution is a worldwide problem, we need to take a big, uh, big problem approach to it. If one state you know, passes a carbon tax or something and the next state doesn't, it's just not gonna work. And since the United States is such a huge economy, if we could get the United States to take the lead on this, well then, because of our economy, we can put pressure on countries all over the world to do the same and we could have that worldwide impact. So that's why we're focused on this particular legislation because we could think it could have such a good jump start to solving climate and then other things can complement it. One of our members, Roberta, is saying she'd be willing to call or write her congressmen and senators. Um, how do I, how does she sign up with you to do that? I'll, I'll put the link to the monthly calling campaign in the chat. Is that okay, Mark? That'd be great. Um, also, I just Googled monthly calling campaign, and it was the second thing that came up. And Barb is asking, what other groups or associations are supporting your proposal? That's a good question. There's, we, that's one of the things we work on is, is grass, grass tops outreach to try and get organizations and endorsers and we're working on it more and more now. Um, we've got, uh, you could look on our website and we have lots of different groups. And one of the neat things about our endorsements, if you look at the different industries and companies and, that are endorsing a plan like ours, is that we do have some groups that you might look at as somewhat conservative and somewhat liberal and are both interested in our plan. Um, in, in particular, recently, we had the Archdiocese of Joliet uh, endorse our plan. And, yeah. um, and so we're, we're getting more faith-based groups involved in endorsing our plan. Um, Terry's group has started a, a group that's trying to um, influence weather broadcasters to say more about climate in their broadcasts. Um, 
one of the interesting things you know, about Citizens Climate Lobby, we've been working on this for 10 years and we've documented our slow and but steady progress. Every year we go to Congress, we, we, get, we have more conversations. We of course wish it was faster, that it would, would be faster, but we're definitely making progress. Liz I, is it. Go ahead, I, Terry. I put, um, I put the link to the monthly calling campaign in there, that cclusa.org slash MCC. And then below that is the, a website about the bill that Mark mentioned, um, energyinnovationact.org. And if you go there, you can, find, you can look for the supporters and you can see we have like 2,000 um, e either individuals or organizations who have um, endorsed uh, endorse the bill. And also those 80, 82 or so um, legislators that co-sponsored our bill in the last Congress, I mean, that was probably 10 times more than any other bill. Yes. Uh, yes. It, it, yes. was asking that question, which congressmen and women are going to introduce the legislation also? Well, we don't know that yet. Um, we know that 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 um, that we're trying to get a represent a Republican and a Democrat to to co-sponsor to introduce it. But as you said, the congressmen are focused on the pandemic right now. They're 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 focused on some other things. So it's probably going to be a little while before we get it introduced. But we're going to keep working on it. The, the original co-sponsor for the, the bill in the House was Congressman Ted Deutsch from Florida. So he, he will be on it. And we don't know who else will be on it when he introduces it. And then a, it, a version was introduced in the Senate in 2018. It was not reintroduced in 2019. But um, in the Senate, it's Senator Chris Coons who kind of owns this bill. Um, so he would be the one, most likely he would be the one to introduce it in the Senate. Um, and that's, that, like, that's interesting because he's like Biden's friend. He's another senator from Delaware. So he has a, a pretty high profile. Um, another interesting bill is um, Senator Dick Durbin introduced a similar bill at the end of um, the last session. It's called America's Clean Future Fund Act, which also has a fee and dividend. Um, it has some different features from this one and he never got very many co-sponsors because it was COVID and everything was in chaos and, and whatever, but he, he has the fee and dividend concept as well, Senator Dick Durbin. And then one more thing I'd like to say before I shut up is that I just read that, I just reread this yesterday, so it's on my mind. This is the only climate legislation in Congress that the Coke uh, industries were lobbying against. And mm -hmm. I think it says a lot about how effective it would be. <laughs> That's great. So we can find more information out on the links you've provided. Um, once this is established, a charge on the the fee on fossil fuels. So, will it be an ongoing um, process? Will it continue on? Is there a time? Well, limit? yeah. But, yeah. Basically, um, it, it it's going to have its it's going to have its own sort of life. Um, it's the the fee is going to go increase ten to fifteen dollars every year. It'll be ten dollars as long as it's working. If it's not. Well, it'll increase to 15, uh, and working as intended, and then uh, keeps going up. Well, fossil fuels are going to use is going to keep going down. So eventually, when we get to net zero fossil fuels, uh, it's 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 likely to have its own um, uh, sunset. Okay, Barb is asking um, what. I mean, and this is a big question, what industries depend on fossil fuels? I mean, it's far reaching. Oh, you're not kidding. Uh, and Terry knows this too, is 
when we were science teachers, I remember uh, um, a little, little project we did sometimes, particularly in chemistry classes, you'd ask your students, okay, how many things in this classroom do you think come from fossil fuels? <laughs> it's basically everything except wood and metal. If it wasn't wood or metal, it was from fossil fuels. And, uh, and then of course, our whole economy, you know, runs on fossil fuels, the, the, uh, the transportation sector, the heating sector, all these things. So, so to say we're gonna, we're gonna go green is a wonderful thing to say, but figuring out how to do it is a, is a tremendous undertaking. And so to have something like this that could just be a toolbox that could get everything going and get everybody innovating would just be phenomenal. Barb is asking if um, Barb Wanzer is there. Is there will there be subsidies for other um, from this? Would there be subsidies solar for solar and wind energy? Would but you're saying that most of the fees the fees will go back to citizens. Yeah, in our bill, all the fees go back except for administrative costs, which will be about 6% or so in the first year, and then they will gradually go down to about 2%. So, um, so the, the, all the money goes back to the citizens, and then they can do what they want with it. And of course, they're gonna do stuff to become more green. Um, but we also um, recognize that, the, and, and of course, solar is gonna be incentivized because they're gonna be more competitive. They're already one of the more competitive forms of energy. So if fossil fuel costs go up, they're gonna be um, more competitive and just, just from the natural marketplace. But we also recognize that there's some things that, that may need to be uh, added you know, as we go forward. We need to do something to help farmers with with uh, that raise cattle and cows and stuff and methane production there. We need to do something, of course, to, to help um, out of work coal workers and communities. So there's definitely things that need to be added uh, in addition to our bill. Sheila's asking a question. How do those in favor of the Green New Deal feel about this legislation? Uh, they're mixed. Uh, some do not like it because they don't feel like, like somebody mentioned, it doesn't, it's not, doesn't do anything for social justice in particular, other than being progressive and helping lower income people more than, uh, than higher income people. Um, and so um, the, it, there, there, some of them uh, would, will be supportive of it as a one step that could be added to others. Other steps, others probably won't like it because of the limited regulation and um, because it's not as progressive as they may like. Um, can I add something to that? Please, please do. Um, we have, as, as Mark said, we have 86 um, co-sponsors and um, a number of those, I'm, I'm just checking the chart here now. Of the 86 co-sponsors, uh, 41 are also co-sponsoring the Green New Deal. So it's, it's quite compatible with the Green New Deal, which would, the Green New Deal is more of a suite of legislation. It's not one bill. Yeah. So this could be one bill in a portfolio of bills that was called the Green New Deal. There's no conflict at all. Um, we, we do, as Mark said, some people think that we think this is the only thing that has to be done, and that's absolutely not true. We don't think that. We know many other things need to be done. So Roberta's asking, who keeps track of all, how, what goes back to the citizens? How do they get their checks? Who, and pay, and you know, who prepares the, again, getting into the details of it, but would it be the federal government? Yeah, that's a good question. The, the bill sets up an administration um, part to administer the, the distribution of the checks. I think I mentioned this, maybe I didn't, I, it's sort of interesting that we've sort of had a practice run during the pandemic, right? That we've, we've distributed uh, a check to people and we're going to distribute another one if we haven't already. And so the government in a way is working out some of the kinks 
of of distributing uh, checks to people, and our checks would, uh, as written, would be distributed monthly. Um, but yeah, the system is in place pretty well already to do that. And how how big do you, Liz is asking? How big do you imagine the dividends would be? Well, that's a good question. Let's. Uh, in year, um, in year 10, I just looked it up, Mark, I always forget this number. In year 10, the annual dividend for a family of four would be about $4,400. Hmm. Here, let me show you this here. Oh, I didn't. Carbon costs and carbon dividends. So here's a more um, detailed description. This is in the first year. So uh, this represents um, each quartile. Um, so the population is divided up into quartiles based on uh, basically income. And these are their energy costs for the first year from direct about using fuel and for their homes and their cars. These are uh, indirect energy costs. These are things like, you know, all the stuff you buy that is indirectly related to uh, fossil fuels. These are investment type costs. And so it makes sense that the quartile one has very little investment type costs associated with fossil fuels and the fifth quartile has quite a bit. And then this is the the revenue that you get yearly from the first year. And you can see that the, the first quartile receives significantly more revenue than what their increased costs would be. And that all the, even the fourth quartile, it's pretty much a wash. And it's not until the fifth quartile that you're paying um, um, a certain, quite a bit more than the revenue you're gonna receive. But of course, for that quartile, it's like less than 0.2% of their income. So it really isn't uh, a, a, that much of a negative. And remember, one of the reasons you know, why, why don't you give all the money to the quartile one and quartile two or something like that and not give any, remember, you have to pass this legislation, right? And you have to pass it. And so you have to have representatives that can go back to their constituents and tell them, this is why this is good for our, your, this, this community. And so if I have a, a, you know, a working class community with some upper level income people, uh, I need to be able to tell them this bill is good for them in order for me to vote for it as their representative. Mm. Yeah, Liz is saying, you know, you know if, if the dividend for those of us that are, have, you know, some means if, to convert to buying electric cars or, you know, it, it might be an incentive. Would that be built? I guess if you want to keep it clean, correct? You want to keep it straightforward. But for those of us that would like to have an electric car, you could put the monthly dividend you get towards your car payment. Absolutely. And, and one, of the, one of the interesting things in our study uh, that we conducted was that some of the people in quartile one and quartile two might, might uh, if they don't have health insurance already or they have co-pays and stuff, they might use it and get better health insurance. Um, this bill, according to our studies, is gonna save so many lives and help so many people just from a health standpoint. Um, by the carbon, could, carbon reduction. Terry, you want to say something more specific? I, I wanted to address Liz's question because, um, uh, Liz, your question is focused on consumer behavior, which we expect will change. But really, the more significant um, lever here is business behavior because um, in businesses will see that fossil energy is going to be steadily rising. And so they can plan for that. And so, um, you know, right, right now it is it's extremely expensive for uh, um, anybody to buy an electric car. But if businesses see that's the future, then there will be more competition and 
the costs of the electric cars will come down. Same thing for you know any of the other um, things we think of as green investments. This is going to um, incentivize entrepreneurs to get into that because people are going to need them. So we expect that the competition in the marketplace will make those products better and cheaper and more available to people. So it, it, you know, the, the plan doesn't really work on the backs of consumers making different choices. It really works more through business making different choices and providing us with different things that, are, that have less embedded carbon in them. Thanks, Terry. This has been great. Any other questions? Um, certainly give us a lot to think about. Um, oh, Jan's got something here. Let's see. She's saying a um, couple more questions here. Um, so Jan's saying some, you know, um, electric furnaces are very difficult here doing the many times we lose power, but um, I guess she's just making kind of a comment about. Um, yeah, home heating without fossil fuels is a challenge. I mean, that, that's true. That's probably the thing I would personally worry about the most. Um, their, their options are, um, for one thing, most homes are not well insulated. So better insulation, there'd be a, a, you know, an, an immediate need for better insulation. I remember reading an article years ago about some super insulated homes in Canada that um, barely even use their furnace, furnace um, because they were so well insulated, the waste heat from the refrigerator and so forth was, was almost enough. So insulation is first step. Um, there are options like um, geothermal heating. It's extremely expensive to do on an individual household basis. It's more practical, um, what they call district heating where um, deep wells are dug um, down to where the earth has a stable temperature and the, it war warms a fluid and the, and the fluid is circulated to homes. And there's, there's actually some gas companies that there's a, we, we read an article recently about some, I can't remember which state, but somewhere in the Northeast um, that a group had, had a group called HEAT, actually H-E-E-T, had succeeded in, in uh, getting some support for this. And gas companies were actually interested because they kind of have the infrastructure for that. Um, and like piping is already there. So that's, you know, that's, that's something. Um, and then um, another, another thing that I've heard of is that um, there, it's possible to substitute um, non-fossil gas in those systems or actually, I don't know if it's possible. It could be possible. I don't know if it's scalable, but like, for example, you can get methane off of landfills. So um, basically a biogas instead of the fossil gas in our gas systems. But, um, but, it, but that, is, that is a difficult problem. And that's one reason why I favor a bill like this, because then you put the um, you know, the, the responsibility for taking risks to see what will work on the private sector rather than having the government like decide, okay, what should we do? Should we make everybody have geothermal wells or should we make everybody have biogas or what should we do? So it, it takes that away and it, it like makes, puts the risk on investors to see what, what's going to work. Incentivize them. Yep. So, um, Sheila had to sign off, but she said, thanks for the info tonight. I've already signed on as a supporter. And she's mm -hmm. going to be a hosting a presentation at the DuPage County Environmental Meeting on Tuesday, in first Tuesday in February. So that was Sheila Rutledge. So that's great. Oh, yeah. that's Sheila Rutledge. Yes. yes. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, the and Elmer Susan's Climate Lobby chapter is going to be there. Yeah. That's right. So we appreciate the information tonight. Um, and um, I think that wraps up our questions. We just want to remind everybody, Jude, if you can put up our, so um, 
our next um, civic series will be Thursday, February 11th at 7. Past, present, and hopeful future of fair housing, Evelyn Sanguinetti will be our speaker. But again, thank you, um, Mark and Terry, for giving us some insights into the, you know, the carbon bill, and we look forward to learning more about it. And thank you for the information in the chat. Thank you. 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 Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Nice to meet you. Bye.